as in all his tablets to the monarchs of his day. Baha'u'llah begins the tablet to Queen Victoria with the announcement of his divine station and summons her to acknowledge him and support his cause. O Queen in London, incline thine ear unto the voice of thy Lord. Lay aside thy desire and set then thine heart towards thy Lord, the Ancient of Days. Baha'u'llah commends Queen Victoria for the British role in the abolition of slavery. He said, We have been informed that thou hast forbidden the trading in slaves. This verily is what God hath enjoined in this wondrous revelation. God hath truly destined a reward for thee because of this. British anti-slavery was one of the most important reform movements of the 19th century, but its history is not without ironies. During the course of the 18th century, the British developed the Atlantic slave trade. Indeed, it has been estimated that between 1700 and 1810, British merchants transported almost 3 million African slaves across the Atlantic. That the British benefited from the Atlantic slave system is indisputable. Yet, paradoxically, it was also the British who led the struggle to bring this system to an end. In the space of some 46 years, between 1787 and 1833, Britain had not only outlawed the slave trade, but also abolished slavery throughout her colonial possessions. This was all accomplished well before Victoria was queen, but as the living symbol of the British constitutional monarchy and parliamentary system, which made it possible to have a direct influence on the institutions of power, the commendation was appropriate and lent support to an ongoing battle against the immoral institutions of slavery, which in various forms persists to this day. Baha'u'llah likewise commends Queen Victoria for having entrusted the reins of council into the hands of the representatives of the people. England was among the first nations to limit the authority of the crown and to establish a parliamentary form of government. But Baha'u'llah broadens the normal parochial role of the parliamentarian, emphasizing the importance of the highest ethical standards and a world-embracing vision. Referring to the representatives of the people, he says, It behooveth them, however, to be trustworthy among his servants, and to regard themselves as the representatives of all that dwell on earth. Addressing the elected representatives of the people everywhere, he points out that their constituency is the whole of mankind. O ye, the elected representatives of the people in every land, Take ye counsel together, and let your concern be only for that which profiteth mankind, and bettereth the condition thereof. Baha'u'llah then prescribes a remedy which can only be understood in the context of his central teaching, that the religion of God is one, and that his manifestations are likewise one, differing only in the temporal aspect of their teachings. Assuming recognition of this non-intuitive spiritual principle, he proclaims, That which the Lord hath ordained as the sovereign remedy and mightiest instrument for the healing of all the world is the union of all its peoples in one universal cause, one common faith. Consider these days in which he who is the ancient beauty hath come in the most great name, that he may quicken the world and unite its people. They, however, rose up against him with sharpened swords, and committed that which caused the faithful spirit to lament, until in the end they imprisoned him in the most desolate of cities, and broke the grasp of the faithful upon the hem of his robe. Were any one to tell them, The world reformer is come, they would answer and say, Indeed it is proven that he is a fomenter of discord. And this, notwithstanding, that they have never associated with him, and have perceived that he did not seek for one moment to protect himself. At all times he was at the mercy of the wicked doers. At one time they cast him into prison, at another they banished him, and at yet another hurried him from land to land. Thus have they pronounced judgment against us, and God truly 
is aware of what I say. Such men are reckoned by God among the most ignorant of his creatures. They cut off their own limbs and perceive it not. They deprive themselves of that which is best for them, and know it not. They are even as a young child who can distinguish neither the mischief-maker from the reformer, nor the wicked from the righteous. We behold them in this day, wrapped in a palpable veil. Baha'u'llah then addresses the practical matter of the burden of excessive taxation and expenditure and reminds the kings that they rule by virtue of the people who sustain and support them. O kings of the earth, we see you increasing every year your expenditures and laying the burden thereof on your subjects. This verily is holy and grossly unjust. Fear the sighs and tears of this wronged one and lay not excessive burdens on your peoples. Do not rob them to rear palaces for yourselves. Nay, rather choose for them that which ye choose for yourselves. Thus we unfold to your eyes that which profiteth you, if ye but perceive. Your people are your treasures. Beware lest your rule violate the commandments of God, and ye deliver your wards to the hands of the robber. By them ye rule. By their means ye subsist, by their aid ye conquer. Yet how disdainfully ye look upon them! How strange! How strange! Baha'u'llah announced himself to all the rulers of his day, directing them to acknowledge him as the manifestation of God for their day, and to accept his remedy for the world's ills, beginning with a recognition of the oneness of mankind and the administration of affairs among nations that derives from the application of that fundamental spiritual principle. Such an acknowledgment, and all that flows from it, would have given rise to that condition which Baha'u'llah called the Most Great Peace, the promised kingdom of God on earth, a peace that would follow inevitably from the practical consequences of the spiritualization of the world and the integration of its races, creeds, classes, and nations. But Baha'u'llah's station was not understood or acknowledged by those who held the reins of power, and his call for reconciliation and world unity was ignored. With this in mind, Baha'u'llah then makes this important statement. Now that ye have refused the most great peace, hold ye fast unto this, the lesser peace, that aptly ye may in some degree better your own condition and that of your dependents. The lesser peace to which Baha'u'llah refers is a global institutional structure to be established by the nations of the world, the aim of which is to foster global cooperation and the abolition of war as a means of settling disputes. Any unbiased observer who is willing to study the writings of Baha'u'llah, will come to the conclusion that his teachings and his counsel to the rulers of his time have in fact become part of the spirit of the age, especially those which deal with the social aspects of the life of man on this planet. Unaware of the source of these teachings, humanity is being moved inexorably to recognize the importance of these ideas and to gradually build the institutions necessary to implement them. One of the principles already enunciated in the Tablet of the Kings, some ten years earlier, was reiterated in the Tablet to Queen Victoria. Addressing all the rulers of the earth, Baha'u'llah clearly articulates the idea of collective security, equating it in the context of a united world with manifest justice. He says, O rulers of the earth, be reconciled among yourselves, that ye may need no more armaments, save in a measure to safeguard your territories and dominions. Beware, lest ye disregard the counsels of the all-knowing, the faithful. Be united, O kings of the earth, for thereby will the tempest of discord be stilled amongst you, and your peoples find rest if ye be of them that comprehend. Should any one among you take up arms against another, 
Rise ye all against him, for this is not but manifest justice. Thus doth the pen of the Most High counsel you, as bidden by him who is the all-knowing, the all-informed. Unfortunately, it took two devastating world wars before this principle was institutionalized, even to an imperfect and limited degree, in the Security Council of the United Nations. And even today, attempts are being made to circumvent this principle and to act unilaterally when vital national interests are deemed to be threatened. Finally, Baha'u'llah reminds the Queen of what has befallen him at the hands of another sovereign, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, and warns her not to deny him in the same way. Beware lest ye act as did the King of Islam when we came unto him at his bidding. His ministers pronounced judgment against us with such injustice that all creation lamented and the hearts of those who are nigh unto God were consumed. The winds of self and passion move them as they will, and we found them all bereft of constancy. They are indeed of those that are far astray. Reign in thy pen, O pen of the Ancient of Days, and leave them to themselves, for they are immersed in their idle fancies. Make thou mention of the Queen, that she may turn with a pure heart unto the scene of transcendent glory, may withhold not her eyes from gazing toward her Lord, and may become acquainted with that which hath been revealed in the books and tablets by the Creator of all mankind. As the inscription on her mausoleum attests, the queen, at the end of her life, perceived her Lord to be Jesus Christ. Would that she had comprehended that the Christ and Baha'u'llah were one in spirit, differing only in the time of their appearance and the sound of their name, and that acknowledgement of Baha'u'llah and acceptance of his remedy for the ills of her time might have saved her subjects and the rest of the world from the horrors which would again be visited upon them less than fourteen years after her death in 1901. Naziruddin Shah was the only monarch to have been closely involved with both the Bab and Baha'u'llah. He was a child of 13 at the time of the Bob's declaration on May 22, 1844, and witnessed the meteoric rise of the Babi movement. At the age of 17, the Crown Prince, Naziruddin Mirza, was present at the Bab's public trial in Tabriz, the provincial capital of Azerbaijan, in 1848. There he met the Bab face to face and heard him declare in ringing tones to the assembled gathering of divines and dignitaries of Azerbaijan that he was the promised one. The attempt on his life on August 15, 1852, by a group of misguided revolutionaries who called themselves Bobbies, had a serious psychological impact on him and served as the pretext for the subsequent pogroms against the entire Bobby community. Having observed the heroic zeal with which the persecuted Babis defended themselves, and having watched with fear and dismay the humiliating defeats they had inflicted on his army, Naziri Din Shah arose with the aid of his ministers and at the instigation of the clergy to wipe out the newly born community from the land of Persia. The execution of the Bab, the martyrdom of thousands of his followers, the imprisonment of Baha'u'llah in his exile to Iraq, together with many atrocities which were committed against an oppressed community, all took place during his reign. In the days of the Bab, the believers defended themselves against their enemies, resulting in many bloody struggles in which the Babis triumphed over their adversaries. However, in the new dispensation, Baha'u'llah enjoined his followers not to resort to force when attacked in the path of God. 
On the first day of his public announcement in the Garden of Rizwan in April 1863, Baha'u'llah proclaimed, among other things, that in his revelation, the use of the sword is prohibited. The principle of the removal of the sword represents a radical transformation of the concept of Nusrat, victory, which in Islam was traditionally understood to include coercion, fighting, and war. But Baha'u'llah creates an entirely new meaning of the term by rejecting holy war, forbidding the coercion of people to faith, and of annulling the denial of rights to non-believers. He prohibits the use of violence against others and repeatedly affirms that it is better to be killed than to kill. Nazuri Shah, stigmatized by Baha'u'llah as the prince of oppressors, was during the period to which we now return at the zenith of his power, the sole arbiter of the fortunes of Persia, surrounded by venal, artful, and false ministers whom he could elevate or abase at his pleasure, the head of an administration in which every actor was, in different aspects, both the briber and the bribed, Allied in his opposition to the faith with a sacerdotal order which constituted a veritable church state, supported by a people notorious for its fanaticism, its servility, cupidity, and corrupt practices, this capricious monarch, no longer able to lay hands upon the person of Baha'u'llah, had to content himself with the task of attempting to stamp out in his own dominions the remnants of a much feared and newly resuscitated community. Next to him in rank and power were his three eldest sons, to whom he had delegated his authority, and in whom he had invested the governorship of all the provinces of his kingdom. The province of Azerbaijan he had entrusted to the weak and timid Muzaffaridin Mirza, the heir to his throne. To the stern and savage rule of the astute Masud Mirza, commonly known as Zilu Sultan, he had committed over two-thirds of his kingdom, including the provinces of Yazd and Isfahan. And upon Kamran Mirza, his favorite son, he had bestowed the rulership of Gilan and Mazindran, and made him governor of Tehran, his minister of war and the commander-in-chief of his army. Such was the rivalry between the last two princes, who vied with each other in courting the favor of their father, that each endeavored, with the support of the leading Mujtahids within his jurisdiction, to outshine the other in the meritorious task of hunting, plundering, and exterminating the members of a defenseless community, who at the bidding of Baha'u'llah had ceased to offer armed resistance, even in self-defense and were carrying out his injunction that it is better to be killed than to kill. The implacable enemies of the faith did not allow the slightest opportunity to pass without striking at an adversary whose liberalizing influences they had even more reason to fear than the sovereign himself. Little wonder that confronted by a situation so full of peril, the faith in Persia should have been driven underground, and that arrests, interrogations, imprisonment, torture, and execution were common features of this convulsive period. The flow of Baha'i pilgrims to Adrianople, and now to Akka, together with the dissemination of the tablets of Baha'u'llah, and the enthusiastic reports of those who had attained his presence, served to inflame the animosity of clergy and laity alike, who had foolishly imagined that the breach which had occurred in the ranks of the faith in Adrianople and the subsequent sentence of life imprisonment imposed on its leader would surely seal its fate. One of the pilgrims to Akka 
was a young man named Akka Buzurg of Khurasan. He arrived in Akka early in 1869, having walked from Mosul in northern Iraq. He was only 17 years of age when he attained the presence of Baha'u'llah during the second year of his confinement in the fortress prison. He was granted an audience with Baha'u'llah only on two occasions. No one knew what happened in those meetings, except that Baha'u'llah said in later tablets that he created him anew with the hands of power and might, and sent him out as a ball of fire. It was in the course of these meetings that Baha'u'llah gave Akabuzur the name Body, meaning wonderful. Baha'u'llah testifies that he disclosed to Body's eyes the kingdom of revelation, and as a result his whole being was filled with an ecstasy that rid him of all attachments to this world, and made him arise to assist his Lord and bring victory to his cause. Baha'u'llah asked Badi to carry a tablet to Naziruddin Shah, which had been revealed in Adrianople. With great pride and eagerness, Badi agreed to be the bearer of that weighty message. Alone and on foot, the heroic Badi carried the tablet to Tehran, a journey of four months, to deliver it into the hands of the sovereign. After his arrival in Tehran, he spent three days in fasting and vigilance. He finally encountered the Shah, proceeding on a hunting expedition to Shimaran. He calmly and respectfully approached His Majesty and called out, O King, I have come to thee from Shiva with a weighty message. The Shah ordered that the tablet be taken from him and delivered to the Mushtahids of Tehran, who were commanded to reply to that epistle, a command which they evaded, recommending instead that the messenger should be put to death. Badi was arrested and tortured. For three successive days he was branded with hot irons, and then he was killed. His head was beaten to a pulp with the butt of a rifle, and his body was thrown into a pit, and earth and stones heaped upon it. For three years after Badi's martyrdom, Baha'u'llah continued to extol in his writings the heroism of that youth, the pride of martyrs, characterizing that sublime sacrifice as the salt of my tablets. That tablet was subsequently forwarded by the Shah to the Persian ambassador in Constantinople in the hope that its perusal by the Sultan's ministers might serve to further inflame their animosity. The tablet to Naziruddin Shah was the lengthiest epistle to any single sovereign. In it, Baha'u'llah testifies to the unparalleled severity of the troubles that had touched him recalls the sovereign's recognition of his innocence on the eve of his departure for Iraq, and adjures him to rule with justice. Baha'u'llah also describes the irresistible summons he received from God in the foul darkness of the Siachar, the dungeon in Tehran, to which the Shah had unjustly consigned him. O King, I was but a man like others, asleep upon my couch, when, lo, the breezes of the All-Glorious were wafted over me, and taught me the knowledge of all that hath been. This thing is not from me, but from one who is almighty and all-knowing. And he bade me lift up my voice between earth and heaven, and for this there befell me what hath caused the tears of every man of understanding to flow. The learning current amongst men I studied not, their schools I entered not. Ask of the city wherein I dwell, that thou mayest be well assured that I am not of them who speak falsely. This is but a leaf which the winds of the will of thy Lord, the Almighty, the All-Praised, have stirred. Can it be still when the tempestuous winds are blowing? Nay. 
by him who is the Lord of all names and attributes. They move it as they list. In this tablet, Baha'u'llah proclaims the unity of God and his prophets, stresses the beneficent influence of his teachings and his condemnation of all forms of violence and mischief. Baha'u'llah expresses the wish to be brought face to face with the divines of the age in order to produce proofs and testimonies in the presence of his majesty, which would establish the truth of his cause. He wrote, This servant is ready and taketh hope in God, that such a gathering may be convened in order that the truth of the matter may be made clear and manifest before his majesty the Shah. It is then for thee to command, and I stand ready before the throne of thy sovereignty. Decide then, for me or against me. In addressing this challenge to the Shah, Baha'u'llah no doubt recalled an earlier incident in Baghdad when the divines demanded that he perform a miracle as conclusive evidence of the authenticity of the station, to which he responded, The ulamas must assemble and with one accord choose one miracle and write that after the performance of this miracle they will no longer entertain doubts about me and that all will acknowledge and confess the truth of my cause. Let them seal this paper and bring it to me. This must be the accepted criteria. If the miracle is performed, no doubt will remain for them. And if not, we shall be convicted of imposture.